Barring no more member statements, I will now recess for uh, less than a minute. Order, please. We'll now move on to oral questions put by members to ministers. The Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, the government's latest plan to update the Children and Family Services Act was sent back to the drawing board for the second time in two weeks, Mr. Speaker. This is a very important issue. As Rowley Thompson, who wrote the original act, said, and I quote, it affects potentially every family and every child. And it definitely affects every poor family and every poor child, and I will table that. The government has been accused of a lack of meaningful consultation, a lack of notice of the changes that are proposed to people working on the front lines, Mr. Speaker. Those children that are affected and the families that care for them, they deserve better. So my question to the Premier, how can he defend the way his government is going about making these important changes? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. I want to, again, to thank the Minister for the work leading into uh, the bill being presented to this House and the consultation, <laughs> and the consultation that has happened, Mr. Speaker, prior to the bill being introduced. I want to thank all of those Nova Scotians who came and made presentation to law amendments, Mr. Speaker. Uh, obviously, they had an impact uh, in the presentation they made. The bill was referred back to the department to see if it could be strengthened. Uh, there were changes made. It was brought back to the committee. The two opposition parties said they didn't have time to look at those amendments. We're providing them an opportunity. The bill will be returned tomorrow. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on his first supplementary. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and the Premier can thank them, and we should all thank them. But the fact of the matter is, they themselves have come and said that the changes that came forward yesterday reflected in no way what they had been telling the government needed to be done. They may have been thanked, but they were not heard, Mr. Speaker. That is the issue. That is no way to go about making important changes like this. And now the government has decided it doesn't want to hear from them anymore. It's uninterested in hearing what they have to say from this point forward. So if the Premier really wants to thank him, will he now get up in his place and commit that we'll hear their voices again when law amendments next meets? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Again, I want to thank all those Nova Scotians who came in and made presentations. And I want to thank the members of the committee, Mr. Speaker, because as long as I've been here, Mr. Speaker, never has a committee listened to the presentations that were presented before them. Did we accept all of the recommendations presented by those making presentations? No, we did not, Mr. Speaker. But the changes to the bill were made by the foundation of what was presented before that committee. We've listened. We, Mr. Speaker, we actually made that committee mean something in this House unlike when that party was in power, and they ignored Nova Scotia's presentation. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on his final supplementary. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, if this was the first time, it would be a reasonable question, but there is the Limitation of Actions Act that they didn't listen and they had to come back and fix it again, Mr. Speaker. The Tobacco Act that they didn't listen and they had to come back and do it over again, Mr. Speaker. Now we're dealing with children and the families that care for them, and twice they haven't listened and they have to go back to the drawing board yet again. Mr. Speaker, if they truly want to honour the people that come to this building and give their opinions, the least they can do is hear them when they bring in their more recent changes. So I'll ask the Premier to commit to listen to what they have to say and allow them to present at law amendments the way it is supposed to be done. The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, let me tell you how law amendments works. People come in and make presentations and the committee members listen, Mr. Speaker. Finally, Nova Scotians have a committee that's actually listening to what's being presented to them, Mr. Speaker. We thank them for making those changes. We brought them back to the Department, Mr. Speaker. It will go back to the committee, Mr. Speaker, and be presented to the House. <clears throat> the Honourable Acting Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, yesterday at the law amendments, committee, we saw an unprecedented six government bills get returned to their departments for further work and review. 
One of them, the Children and Family Services Act, was, re was sent back for the second time. It's a clear example of the flawed legislation this government is producing, due primarily to their complete lack of consultation with important stakeholders and other Nova Scotians beforehand. Mr. Speaker, my question for the Premier is this. The Premier said his government was the most open and transparent government the province would see. Why is the Premier's government making all its decisions behind closed doors in government departments <clears throat> without regard for the input and the advice from Nova Scotians? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. I couldn't disagree with the content of the question, Mr. Speaker. The reality of it is the departments have gone out spoken to stakeholders, Mr. Speaker. We provided an opportunity for Nova Scotians to come to law amendments. And, Mr. Speaker, we listened uh, to Nova Scotians when they come and make presentations. Have we accepted all of the changes that, Mr. Speaker, they were coming forward? No. But have we listened and made amendments to the bills that we believe would strengthen in the best interest of Nova Scotians? Of course we did. It's unfortunate that that member didn't practice that when she was on this side of the House. The Honourable Acting Leader of the New Democratic Party on her first supplementary. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the reality is we see time and time again a government that fails to consult with Nova Scotians. Mr. Speaker, they're attempting to make amendments to several substantial pieces of legislation, including the Family and Children's Services Act, the Liquor Control Act, the Motor Vehicle Act, all without ample consultation. Mr. Speaker, and advocates and experts and many others who sat through law amendments yesterday, including HRM, who the entire council rejects the Heritage Act, um, have said they were not consulted on these important matters. So my question for the Premier is this. Why isn't the Premier ensuring his ministers consult widely before <clears throat> bringing flawed legislation to the floor of the House? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Mr. Speaker, I again want to uh, assure the, the Member and all Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker, that consultation is taken and, uh, with uh, stakeholders across our province on all legislation that comes before this House, Mr. Speaker. But unlike uh, what's taken place when that party was in power, law amendments actually is working. Nova Scotians have come in made changes, Mr. Speaker, made recommendations for changes. We've accepted some of those recommendations, Mr. Speaker. The bill went back to the Department to be amended. We'll re present it back to the committee tomorrow to be returned to the House. <clears throat>
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I also believe my colleague, Minister of Education, also has uh, some further uh, knowledge uh, about this organization. The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. And I certainly would like to welcome again the parents who are here from Path, Path to Learning. And I do want to uh, clarify so that everyone in the House understands uh, this is a private school. Uh, they have applied to the Department for designation as a special education school for which we provide tuition support. Uh, we have three schools in the province now who currently have that designation. They have applied for that designation. Their application is at the Department and it is in the uh, uh, application process right now. The Honourable Acting Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, my question for you is to the Minister for community services. Mr. Speaker, the Brunswick Street nonprofit organization is located in North End, Halifax, and they saw their subsidy cut this summer by Housing Nova Scotia. Following the subsidy cancellation, residents were hit with large rent increases in order to stay in their homes. Ursula Cullum, a single mom, has lived there since 2011 with her young son. When her subsidy was eliminated by Housing Nova Scotia on August 1st, her rent increased by $220 a month, an increase of 34%. Mr. Speaker, I wonder if the minister can explain to Ursula and other residents of the Brunswick Street Nonprofit Association why the subsidy for Brunswick Street <coughs> Nonprofit was eliminated. The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Thank you for the question. Uh, and, I, and I absolutely understand the uncertainty for tenants who are caught uh, in, uh, in nonprofit organizations that are struggling with their financial viability. How subsidies work, and I know this from my previous experience with Alice Housing, is that a subsidy is given to the nonprofit. As the mortgage comes down, the subsidy decrease. The goal of the subsidy at the end of the day is for the nonprofit to use the mortgage payment when the mortgage is done, um, and then you know help help the tenants have a reasonable, affordable uh, uh, living situation. We continue and will continue to work with the tenants and certainly the nonprofit autonomous board, because they do have a board of directors. They have the right to make those decisions, but we are dedicated to working with them so that uh, we, can, we can have a real clear, affordable way uh, forward for folks that are living with this organization. <clears throat> the Honourable Acting Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response. Mr. Speaker, according to a briefing note, prepared for the minister, it shows that her department has yet to allocate as much as $4 million under the Federal Provincial Social Housing Agreement. And I'll table that, Mr. Speaker. Shirley Joyce, an 80-year-old woman who, lived, who has lived at Brunswick Nonprofit over three decades, received an eviction notice late last week. She has until December the 15th, two weeks from now, to pack up her things and find a new place to live. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to ask the Minister, how is it possible that an 80-year-old woman is being forced out of her home when the Minister has millions at her disposal? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Thank you, uh, and thank you for the question, and, and I, I would hope um, it, it, that to everybody in this chamber would be unconscionable to have uh, such uh, uh, um something like that happen to any tenant, let alone a senior living uh, in affordable housing. Um, all landlords, whether it be social landlords, public sector landlords, must follow the Residential Tenancy Act, and I encourage anyone who's been giving two weeks to vacate a, uh, a unit, go with that. Uh, I have actually released millions upon millions of dollars from the Deferred Federal Contribution Fund, which no other government has done over the last couple of decades, and provided over 300 red supplements um, in the last year. Uh, and not, not just for a year, but for 10 years going forward to make sure that those units stay affordable in the community. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Today, Nova Scotians got to see the details of the government's new electricity plan called Our Electricity Future. It appears that our future includes continuing to pay for the guaranteed profit of Nova Scotia Power, which is directly contrary to the Liberal election platform, which said, and I quote, stop asking Nova Scotians to fund Nova Scotia Power's profits. So I'll ask the Premier, 
Why is it now okay with him that Nova Scotia ratepayers will fund Nova Scotia Power's profits? The Honourable Premier. I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member for the question, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I want to also tell the Honourable Member, in case he hasn't had time to read the entire bill, that performance standards are put in place, uh, Mr. Speaker. Never before has this utility been held to a standard of excellence, Mr. Speaker. Those standards will be, put, be uh, developed through the Utility Review Board, and they will be accountable to the people of this province through the Utility Review Board, Mr. Speaker. And I want to remind this host, never before uh, has that utility been held to that standard, Mr. Speaker, and power rates are reflecting this government's ability to rein in that utility. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotia Power's guaranteed profit remains at nine and a quarter percent. And the government proposes a fine of up to a million dollars, Mr. Speaker, less than one percent of that annual profit. That is not a serious fine. In fact, I don't know if the Premier had time to look across the country to see what other provinces do, but in Alberta, and I will table this, the draft regulations there propose that they fine their utilities up to a million dollars a day. In Nova Scotia, it's a million dollars per year, Mr. Speaker, a joke of a fine. On top of that, we now know that they're going to extend the efficiency tax another year up to 2019, and we'll all pay for that too, Mr. Speaker. So I'll ask the Premier, why is he asking ratepayers now to pay for that guaranteed profit and the efficiency fee that he campaigned against for an extra year? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I again want to thank the Honourable Member for his question. I want to thank the Minister of Energy for the great work that he's been doing on behalf of the citizens of this province. I want to tell you, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Finally, a government has put in performance standards that this utility be held accountable for, Mr. Speaker. And finally, Nova Scotians can bank on stable energy prices, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. And I, want to remind, and I want to remind all members of this House, when the last time the two opposition parties were in power, power rates have grown by 70 percent under their leadership, Mr. Speaker. Under our government, they're stable. Yeah. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Well, we'll see, Mr. Well, we'll see, Mr. Speaker. Which side are you on? <laughs> we'll see, Mr. Speaker. We'll see. We'll see because the government itself is allowing Nova Scotia Power one more kick at the can by next March to raise their power rates for all Nova Scotians, something they clearly campaigned against, Mr. Speaker. On top of that. It also appears that our electricity future, as the government puts it, includes continuing the monopoly that Nova Scotia Power enjoys, that all Nova Scotians have to pay to one supplier, which is Nova Scotia Power. But I'd like to give the Premier a chance to clear that up. Can he stand in his place and tell Nova Scotians <coughs> when they will be able to buy power from someone else besides Nova Scotia Power? The Honourable Premier. I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. I want to tell all those citizens that live in the municipal utilities across the province, the six of them, Mr. Speaker, they can do so now. And I want to tell the Honourable Members and all members of this House, there's a hearing ongoing right now, and the rest of Nova Scotians will be able to do so soon. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Well, now we see the Premier defending the status quo, Mr. Speaker. The, mis the municipalities have always had that ability, and nothing has changed. Premier Dexter could have easily given the exact same answer that this Premier just gave. But now they've painted the picture of what our electricity future looks like. And it includes more rate increases, Mr. Speaker. We continue to pay the efficiency fee until at least 2019 through our rates. That guaranteed profit remains with a tiny, tiny little slap on the wrist. Maybe someday, Mr. Speaker, and the monopoly rolls on. So, Mr. Speaker, my question to the Premier, why did he make this list of promises to the people when he had no idea how to keep them? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I'll have the Minister of Energy respond. The Honourable Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, we heard from 1,300 Nova Scotians who told us exactly what they want to see in the electricity plan, which was predictability, stability, accountability, and innovation. All that's been provided. Now, Mr. Speaker, one would think after a while that the leader of the official opposition would learn because for the past year, we've watched both him and the member for Pic East remind us a bit of a chicken little episode of running around the province saying power rates are going up in 2016. Mr. Speaker, if everything goes as is anticipated, I get to use a word that no Minister of Energy has been able to use in the last 10 years. In 2016, power rates are expected to decrease. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Mr. Speaker. 
Mr. Speaker, today we are joined by three women who live in Harbor City Homes residences on Brunswick Street in the north end of Halifax. Harbor City Homes is another non-profit housing society. The society has put a number of buildings up for sale, including those that Deb, Linda and Jennifer reside in. The sale of Harbor City homes likely will mean an increase to their rent, and they are very concerned that they have been unable to get any answer from Housing Nova Scotia on their future housing prospects. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister detail for residents of Harbor City homes here today what her department is doing to keep Harbor City homes affordable? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Thank you, and I thank you for the question. Uh, like the Brunswick Street and like every other nonprofit housing organization who really strive every day to provide affordable housing for folks in Nova Scotia, Harbor Cities is a nonprofit that's autonomous of housing Nova Scotia. They have their own board of governors or directors, and they have their own sustainability and business plan. My commitment to the people who live in Harbor Cities has been and will be that if they find that they cannot afford to live there that I will offer them rent supplements so that they can find safe affordable housing within the community. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Mr. Speaker, residents across Nova Scotia are increasingly unable to uh, afford staying in their homes. The women, women from Harbour City Homes have been calling on the Minister to address the situation since August. We know that the Minister has millions of dollars at her disposal to invest in rent subsidies for women like Deb, Linda and Jennifer but to date has failed to do so. Mr. Speaker, affordable housing was part of this government's election platform. However, it seems to have been a false promise. Mr. Speaker, will the minister commit to meeting with residents of Har Harbour City Homes to hear their concerns and offer the services of her department to address their concerns? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Thank you for the question. Of course I would. I've met with many people throughout the province that, have, uh, that work in the nonprofit housing uh, industry and also uh, tenants. I have not seen a request for a uh, meeting, but I think I just answered your question in saying that I absolutely would, con would offer uh, rent supplements uh, to anyone who felt they had to leave Harbour Cities. Um, you know, this government, and I'm very proud of the record of releasing millions of dollars from the deferred federal contribution that has not been re released by any government, including that members, uh, for decades. And so we have really made investments from rent subsidies to shoring up cooperatives to assisting nonprofits throughout the province to make sure that safe, affordable housing is, is there for people when they need it. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Wellness. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Health and Wellness was in attendance in late September when the Digby and Area Health Services Centre was officially opened. Digby and Area residents raised $2.1 for this centre, and it led the Premier to say that afternoon at the opening, thank you for knowing what your community needed and fighting for it and for not letting anything get in your way. And, Mr. Speaker, I will table the article from the Digby Courier where the Premier is quoted from September 27th. Kings County residents have now raised, uh, completed raising $8 million towards the cost of a new hospice. Mr. Speaker, my question for the Minister is this. Does the Minister feel volunteers in Kings County are not doing enough or maybe they're, not le uh, they're letting things get in their way on the hospice project since we've been waiting for this announcement for two the years? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, I would say that uh, the, the member for, uh, for Kings North has, uh, has made a, a totally uh, inaccurate picture uh, in terms of where we are with uh, hospice uh, funding. Uh, when we came to government, it was a zero around a provincial palliative care strategy. Uh, there was nothing in terms of how, to, how you could have governance or a funding model for, uh, uh, for the hospice. And uh, what I can tell the member opposite is that uh, they are now at the MOU stage uh, with, the, with the provincial health authority and the hospice to work out a funding agreement uh, that, in fact, will see the project go forward. <clears throat> the Honourable Member for Kings North. Thank you uh, to the Minister, Mr. Speaker, for that answer. 
Mr. Speaker, in a June 4, 2015 article in the Kings County Advertiser, the Minister of Health and Wellness announced a new collaborative health centre for Kingston. The office is close to his constituency office in Kingston, only about 15 minute drive from Soldiers Memorial in Middleton, which struggles to stay open, uh, ER struggles to stay open on a consistent basis, and only about 15 minute drive from a health clinic in Berwick. There was no community fundraising reported in this Kingston announcement in June. Mr. Speaker, my question for the Minister is how does announcing a collaborative health care centre for Kingston make any sense in light of the millions raised for the hospice? The huge community support for it, yet no announcement for it. The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as we know, collaborative practices have been developing across the province uh, for the last uh, six uh, to eight years. Uh, and, uh, and also, uh, we need to correct uh, his, uh, his, uh, his announcement about the closures at Soldiers Memorial. I'm pleased to say that in 2015, it had two closures uh, for the entire year. Uh, the, the member opposite knows that uh, in order to have a hospice uh, run uh, sustainably for the future, uh, you have to have a, a proper funding model. And uh, that's what is now currently being worked out between the Hospice Society uh, and the Nova Scotia Health Authority. And, uh, and I think we'll all see uh, good progress uh, uh, in the new year in terms of the future of the hospice in the Valley and the one in Halifax as well. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In the last two sessions, I've asked the Minister of Health for an update on his department's decision to fund Oncotype DX. It's a diagnostic test for women diagnosed with breast cancer. According to the organization Rethink Breast Cancer, roughly 780 women were diagnosed with breast cancer in Nova Scotia uh, this year. This test would help determine whether or not a woman would undergo chemotherapy and help, other, and help predict whether the cancer will reoccur. Uh, the physical toll, long-term consequences, and emotional stress with chemotherapy can cause, should be considered, and women should not be put through it unnecessarily. So my question to the Minister is, has the Minister come to a decision on whether or not the province will fund this important diagnostic test? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And what I can report to the member opposite to today uh, is that uh, this, uh, th this we, we know the value of this particular procedure. However, there are also uh, alternatives uh, uh, to that particular test. And uh, right now, the, uh, the medical community are still doing uh, uh, trials uh, to see whether or not uh, they, in fact, will even ask uh, that, this, uh, that this test, in fact, be funded. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. You know, Mr. Speaker, not only can this test save women from unnecessarily undergoing chemotherapy treatment, it can also save the health care system thousands of dollars. Nova Scotia Breast Cancer Site team made up a positive recommendation to the Minister. Last year, he told the members of this House that, quote, he did not receive an advisory to proceed at this time with that particular procedure to be covered by the Department of Health and Wellness. So my question to the Minister, and I'll table these documents, who exactly advised the Minister against this procedure, and why hasn't he accepted the recommendation by the experts to save both women and the health care budget unnecessarily stress? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. What I'm pleased to say is that uh, uh, we, we have, uh, you know, great outcomes uh, uh, with breast cancer treatment uh, here, uh, here in Nova Scotia. Uh, in fact, we, we moved from, uh, at one point, uh, we had the worst outcomes uh, in the country. Uh, now we have uh, the best or second be best. We alternate uh, there according to whatever year at, uh, that the... Uh, the uh, uh, whole evaluation uh, may be done. Uh, I know that this uh, particular uh, screening test uh, is still, in, is still, in fact, uh, one that, uh, that we don't have certainty about, and it's one that I'm certainly uh, uh, open to review uh, as more information comes forward. The Honourable Member for Queens, Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. In 2014, the minister introduced a Segway pilot project to test, and I repeat, consult, consult on the Segway use on streets and sidewalks. The pilot project continues until January 2016, and I'll table that. 
Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is, why has the Minister introduced legislation prior to the completion of this pilot project? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, with the two-year pilot segue, there was a number of um, respondents with respect to actual users, which there was about 420 uh, pedestrians who, who witnessed the, the uh, segways in use, which was about 850. Uh, over the three years since the segways have been introduced to the waterfront, there were 7,000 users with no uh, collisions or injuries reported. Mr. Speaker, at the end of, of this session, uh, we figure that we want to give the private sector entities who are looking at segways time to be ready for the spring tourism season, so the legislation makes sense now. Just as a note with respect to the pilot project, uh, when we're receiving this feedback, in October there were 11 respondents. In November, the entire month of November, there have been two respondents. So as the season gets colder, winter comes on, there's, no, uh, there's not a, a whole lot of uptake with respect to the feedback for segways. We really feel we have enough data, Mr. Speaker, and we're making a good decision. The Honourable Member for Queen Shelburne. Well, yesterday, Mr. Speaker, increasingly the public are seeing flaws in this government. They don't consult and they don't use good information before they make decisions. Yesterday, at law amendments, we've heard from the Halifax Cycling Coalition that they were asked to give their members a survey on the use of segways. Before the minister saw their results, he was on the news, Mr. Speaker, telling CBC, and I quote, from a consultation perspective, there has been no negative feedback whatsoever, end of quote. Mr. Speaker, how can the Minister say there has been no negative feedback when he has yet to receive the feedback? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, from our perspective, the, the, uh, the studies and the surveys weren't directed at any particular group. They were open to the public, obviously, with, with 850 uh, witnessing this, the segways, 400 uh, and some odd uh, that actually used it and were riders, again, with the 7,000 in total who did use them, who didn't do the survey. And, Mr. Speaker, uh, from, a, from a perspective of, of satisfaction, 93% who used them felt in control, 94% who, who saw them figured they were safe to ride, uh, and, and all of the feedback with respect to collisions, there was a very small amount, 2%. Uh, it all uh, was rel related to segways bumping into each other. So it wasn't a pedestrian issue, a cyclist issue, an issue for vehicles. Mr. Speaker, we've done a lot of consultation here. It's been two years of a pilot project. Again, Mr. Speaker, we were fully in support of this. We did the right thing, and this is a good step for tourism, economic development, and supporting entrepreneurs in this province. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Pictou Centre. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the issue of bed bugs continues to plague too many Nova Scotians. The same can be said for other housing units managed by Housing Nova Scotia. An effective measure is the use of trained dogs. We have recently learned from pest control professionals that these dogs are no longer permitted to be used in identifying bed bug infestations. A garbage chute at Vimy Arms here in the city is infested with bed bugs. Many housing units are facing the same problem. My question for the Minister of Community Services. What plans does the Minister have to ensure people living in housing Nova Scotia units do not have to deal with bed bugs infestations? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, the, the welfare of, and the comfort of the people that call social housing within Nova Scotia home is, is absolutely imperative. One of the, the issues that has been an ongoing uh, issue for both the private sector, the public sector, has been bed bugs. I was, uh, yesterday I was really encouraged to hear uh, that some of the pilot projects that we've actually done in some of the manors in Halifax using diatomaceous earth have actually been working and so much so that the nonprofit sector and the private sector actually want to come in and study those pilot projects uh, because we've had such extraordinary results uh, with that earth, um, which actually eradicates the bed bugs uh, in, in the housing uh, organizations. The Honourable Member for Pictou Centre. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, bed bugs were a problem for at least a year at the Harbour View Apartments in Dartmouth, where people were actually moving out in September. Nova Scotia's Residential Tenancy Act states the landlord is responsible for keeping the building in a good state of repair and fit for living. In New Brunswick, the Residential Tenancy Act further goes a, step, uh, goes a step further and states that the landlord may be ordered to compensate tenants for the cost of extermination. And my uh, final question for the Minister, will the Minister ensure housing Nova Scotia units are effectively treated for bed bugs 
or will she compensate tenants for the cost of exterminating bed bugs? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Thank you for the question. Uh, last year, just in the Metropolitan Regional Housing Authority alone, we invested over $330,000 on the bed bug issue. We actually are probably one of the few uh, landlords in Nova Scotia that have a 24-hour turnaround where either spraying or this new pilot project will happen. We work very diligently with our clients to ensure there's uh, education with, with the, the people who live with us. We help them in decluttering. We help them uh, move furniture out and clean that furniture. Uh, and we've had wonderful feedback from clients who have said we've actually gone above and beyond. So I'm really pleased with this pilot project. Uh, it's worked, and I think we're going to increase it so that it goes to all of our housing authorities. The Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question through you is to the Minister of Business. Mr. Speaker, last year this government saw fit in their budget to do away with the Department of Economic and Rural Development. They also have a department known as Nova Scotia Business Inc., and it's under the responsibility of this minister. Currently, to the best of my knowledge, we only have one in individual employed in that department in Sydney. My question to the minister is quite simple. Are there any members of the Board of Directors of Nova Scotia Business Inc. from Cape Breton Island? The Honourable Minister of Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my colleague for the question, recognize the hard work uh, of the NSBI uh, employee in Cape Breton. Uh, that was a, uh, a significant investment in, uh, in the dialogue and discussion within Cape Breton Island and supported, uh, Mr. Speaker, by the full team at NSBI in, uh, in Halifax. I don't, uh, I don't have the list of, uh, of NSBI members before me but certainly more than prepared to, uh, to review that list and uh, respond appropriately to my colleague. The Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, I will inform the Minister that there is not a single person on the Board of Directors from Nova Scotia Business, Inc. And a question, I guess, that begs to be answered for all the members from Cape Breton Island, for the community of Cape Breton Island, last week in this House, you stood and you could not Order, give a real please. answer. I'd like to remind the Honourable Member not to refer to members opposite directly. The Honourable Member for Sydney River Myra Lewisburg. Thank you for that correction, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate it very much. Last week, the, ministers did not, the Minister could not answer with a direct yes or no about the closure of, a, of, a, of the tourism offices and visitors, visitors information centre in Port Hastings. Today, he doesn't know who's on the board of Nova Scotia Business Inc. And as a matter of fact, there's nobody there for Cape Breton. So I'd like him to explain to all Cape Bretoners why there's nobody good enough from Cape Breton to be on your board. <clears throat> the Honourable Minister of Business. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank my colleague for the question. Uh, you know, uh, Mr. Speaker, we've been criticized for not having dialogue with, uh, with stakeholders. And when we do go out and engage stakeholders and have robust, genuine dialogue, we're still being criticized. The objective, Mr. Speaker, the objective, Mr. Speaker, the objective, Mr. Speaker, is to recognize the value and assets of Cape Breton. We work locally, Mr. Speaker, and we work collectively across the province. Order, to support please. The, the, the Honourable Member for... Minister of Business has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> the, the Honorable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. We've learned uh, recently that new guidelines are being proposed, or for that matter, may be in effect today, dealing with the credentialing of physicians who want to work or practice in Nova Scotia. So I'm wondering if the Minister of Health can provide us with some up, uh, an update on the changes made with the approval of physicians' credentials, which allow them to practice medicine in Nova Scotia. The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. As, uh, as the former minister uh, would know that uh, we had uh, nine uh, different health districts uh, that would do uh, credentialing uh, in the past. Uh, now, uh, now that we have the one provincial health authority uh, plus the IWK, uh, we will have uh, 
even a uh, greater streamlining of the credentialing process. I'm pleased to say that when applications uh, come into the department, uh, we are able to get them out uh, in, about a, in about a month in terms of their, uh, their approval uh, to practice and then they're taken over by the Nova Scotia Health Authority. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. But the Minister is forgetting to, uh, in, uh, or tr is not uh, providing us with the information. Some of the guidelines, uh, Mr. Speaker, are going to restrict uh, physicians uh, and their ability to be uh, cre have the credentials that they need to practice medicine. And w in one of those areas, Mr. Speaker, is in uh, walk-in clinics. Um, Primary care is something that we support and invested in uh, as a government. The recruitment of newly graduating medical students is extremely important, Mr. Speaker. So how are the changes uh, to the credential guidelines going to ensure that newly graduating medical students stay in Nova Scotia when they are indicating the opportunities for those new students will be restricted? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'm pleased to say that uh, uh, there, uh, there, there will not be uh, uh, any significant uh, restrictions on doctors to practice uh, in the province. Uh, what we will have in place is a streamlined process uh, that the Nova Scotia Provincial Health Authority uh, will bring into practice uh, in, uh, in February. Uh, Walk-in clinics uh, are part of the current uh, primary care model. Uh, and they, uh, they will remain uh, in place. Unfortunately, uh, there was uh, uh, some misinformation that went out to residents. I'm pleased to say that as of today, Dr. Harrigan uh, will meet with all residents in the province and give them that clear path to practice in Nova Scotia. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question through you is to the Minister of Agriculture. There are 52 branches of the Women's Institutes of Nova Scotia in our province. Guided by their motto, for home and country, these women do excellent work that strengthen our communities. Women Institutes aim to help rural and urban women acquire knowledge and skills needed to meet the demands of life in the 21st century, including nutrition, education, consumer awareness, environmental issues, and balancing family and work. In addition to this, they support many worthy causes and charities. Does the Minister agree that the Women's Institutes do tremendous work that should be encouraged and promoted by this government? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Member, for the question. It's a very important organization in the province, and indeed I've met with them on more than one occasion, and they do provide an excellent service to the province. And, and indeed uh, help the uh, industry, the farming industry, and the province as a whole. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Women's Institutes of Nova Scotia have a provincial office which is instrumental in providing support and coordination for the province's 53 branches, in addition to being a central contact point for those interested in volunteering. There is a concern, though, among members that this funding for the office may be in jeopardy. The province's public accounts uh, released a report last spring that indicated the department provided the Women's Institute with a grant of 27000 and I'll table that. Will the minister commit today to continue providing at the same level or more to the Women's Institutes of Nova Scotia to help them continue the good work they do in our communities? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. I'm very pleased that the uh, member has uh, raised this question. Evidently, you didn't do your homework very well. Uh, we, have, uh, we have signed a five-year MOU with the Women's Institute uh, regarding funding for this very important uh, topic, and indeed the first year that funding is well over double the $27,000 a year. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Yes, CBC yes, has reported yes, an exodus of obstetricians in Nova Scotia, and I'll table that, Mr. Speaker. This year, six Dalhousie residents didn't stay in Nova Scotia, and there were six uh, resignations as a direct result of the government's mishandling of the malpractice insurance fees. The NDP caucus has obtained a briefing note that indicates there will be an, a multiple obstetrician retirement in the next 12 months, but doesn't say how many, Mr. Speaker. So I'd like to ask the Minister. How many obstetricians are going to retire this year and where? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, 
Th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. What I can tell the member opposite uh, is that uh, we're now in that uh, time of the year uh, where uh, we are receiving uh, uh, some notification uh, th uh, to the department that uh, we will have a few retirements uh, in the specialty area of, uh, of obstetrician gynecology. We also, uh, you know, have uh, residents uh, who are uh, and fellow and people who are finishing fellowships uh, who will also be looking at the province. Uh, I'm pleased to say that we have also attracted uh, a couple of uh, new obstetrician gynecologists uh, to the province, and I will get that exact number for the member. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, because 12 will have a dramatic uh, impact on the services that they provide Nova Scotian women. Uh, the Minister's briefing note also shows that surgical wait times in gynecology has risen 20% in the last two years in the Valley Regional Hospital, has seen the most significant increase, 62% after gynecologists have uh, their access to the operating room reduced, uh, after the gynecologists have had their access to the operating room reduced, Mr. Speaker. So I'd like to ask the Minister, how does the Minister explain the reduction in gynecologists' access to operating room, and how is that going to improve health care services for Nova Scotians? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank, you for, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we do have uh, a couple of uh, pressure points uh, uh, in the system uh, in terms of uh, the timely, uh, timely access. Uh, what I can tell the member uh, opposite uh, is that now we are able to uh, uh, have those who are uh, needing that uh, clinical uh, service. Uh, some, in fact, uh, have, uh, have been able to uh, come to the IWK and others are able to move to uh, other sites across the province. And that uh, wait list, uh, I'm, I'm convinced, will uh, uh, go down in the, uh, in the next year. The Honourable Member for Colchester, Muscadabit Valley. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is for the uh, Minister of TIR. Most of my calls that, uh, that come in have to do with roads. And uh, a lot of my roads are gravel roads. When they're graded, uh, they're good for a day or two, but when the rain comes afterwards, the roads are right back to where they were before. So my question is, uh, is there an initiative, an initiative in, in progress uh, to redo some of these gravel roads? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member for the question. I can certainly relate. A lot of my calls are on roads, too, so I can uh, tell you you're not alone there. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with it, without question, with respect to uh, with gravel uh, and, and grading, it's a challenge, no question. And any time we get uh, significant weather, sleet, and precipitation, as we did last year, uh, there becomes a challenge that, that really gets into spring, and then we're into the, the, the dry season where we're trying to keep dust control uh, and add gravel and, and do some grading where we can. So, Mr. Speaker, there's certainly uh, no easy uh, answer to that question and again as uh, the member and I have had conversations many times it really becomes about the, the staff at the local level TIR they do their very best and prioritize based on, on feedback from the community based on uh, feedback from the stakeholders and I know that they have a good relationship with the MLA so if there's anything specific that I can bring forward to uh, my very competent department members down there I'll certainly do so thanks the honorable member for Colchester Muscadabit Valley uh, just to follow up uh, mr. speaker is there money available now to redo some roads, gravel? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as we get into the, the winter maintenance season, uh, obviously the line items are pretty stretched for the, for the local budgets, uh, but certainly uh, sometimes the, the local department staff can, can do things, especially if there's an urgent nature, uh, as the uh, members indicating there may be on some of his roads. So certainly that's a uh, decision and a conversation we can have at the local level, and for sure if there's anything we can do, uh, we'd be happy to help out. Thanks. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Pictou East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs. A serious gas shortage hit the, uh, hit the province in August, and the, uh, the Minister said that a, a, uh, a report on gas supply in Nova Scotia with recommendations was due in November. So my question for the Minister today is, has the Minister received the report on the gas supply in Nova Scotia? The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I've been informed by the independent uh, panel that the report itself has been completed in draft form. Um, however, they do want to double check some of the findings in the report with stakeholders, with certain companies. 
and uh, we are anticipating releasing that report um, uh, by December 8th at this point. The Honourable Member for Pitco East. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that for that answer. But I just just to clarify, so the department, nobody in the department has actually seen the report yet. It's with the independent panel. Is that correct? The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have not seen the draft report yet. Um, we are giving the independent panels panelists again. This this is an independent group uh, the chance to fact check the report. Uh, before they submit it for for uh, for my viewing, and at that point we will move very quickly to make that report available to the public. As I know, Nova Scotians are very anxious to see what we are able to do to mitigate the risk of a fuel shortage happening again in our province, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Queen Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Wellness. Last session, I was on my feet regular to address the uh, Minister of Health about the chronic closures of. Roseway emergency room. I was also one of over 100 people who rallied in Shelburne last month when the minister was in town, and I heard him finally promise to address the closures by November the 15th of this year and tell the crowd he had a short-term and long-term plan. Mr. Speaker, it's been over a month since the minister has made this promise. Where is the short-term solutions he has promised, and why does this Order, please. Time allotted for oral questions put by members to ministers has expired. We'll now move on to government business. The Honourable Government House Leader. Speaker, would you please call public bills for second reading? We'll now call public bills for second reading. Speaker, would you please call Bill Number 110, the Marine Renewable Energy Act? We'll now call Bill Number 110, the Marine Renewable Energy Act. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I do wish to say a few words on this bill. It is, uh, in fact, a very important bill for all Nova Scotia, but also one of particular interest to Parsborough and the Fundy Shore area. After all, Mr. Speaker, I think all Nova Scotians now have come to learn that the energy potential of the Bay of Fundy area is one of our greatest opportunities for future supply of renewable, permanent, long-term, fixed-price energy, Mr. Speaker. And it's one of the great wonders of the world that we have right here in our own province. Uh, developing that resource in a responsible